All right, now we're going to be talking about the brain, the gross anatomy of the brain to start off with before we get into the internal nuclei and the uh, circuits that make up the functional elements of the brain. Uh, so this is lecture 4-1 where we're going to uh, introduce some of this terminology about the brain and, and show you some of the primary features. So every human brain is tightly de uh, controlled during development so that the individual ridges and grooves uh, called gyri and sulci respectively uh, match a certain pattern and that pattern is reproduced in every brain across uh, well not at you but across uh, different individuals so because of this we can identify these ridges and grooves assign names to them and discover their functionality uh, so that forms the basis of this lecture. But first, uh, just to talk about the general appearance of the brain. Uh, humans have a highly encephalized brain. Uh, that means our brains are highly developed and, and very tightly packed and organized. And most of the processing that happens in our brains occurs on a very thin layer along the outside of the brain called the cortex and the cortical layers. Uh, so, <clears throat> because of this, we need to maximize the surface area of the brain so that we can maximize the amount of processing that can occur. And because of that, our human brains have developed uh, ridges and grooves as our, our brain forms this undulating surface, which increases the uh, surface area of the brain. So we are increasing the number of neurons uh, within the cortex. Uh, as a result. Uh, the other result is that uh, unfortunately some neurons might be very distant from each other because of this. So while we have a lot of neurons they have to connect and interact in, uh, in ways over great distances. There, some animals might not um, you know, have that problem. So on this slide we're seeing different degrees of encephalization of the brain. Uh, so we have a very highly gyrencephalic brain, whereas a, uh, so a monkey has a less gyrencephalic brain, whereas a mouse uh, has very little cor uh, relative uh, amount of cortex volume-wise, surface area-wise. So it's not gyrencephalic, it's a smooth brain. And so uh, the smooth brain is, is termed lysencephalic because Lizards, reptiles, they all have small, smooth brains. You can see, in fact, uh, just how gyrencephalic the dolphin brain is here. Uh, in fact, the, um, a, a lot of the extra gyrencephalic features of the dolphin brain occur around the insular cortex and the temporal area. Um, you know, the, those regions in the human are related to... Um, uh, internal, so senses of the internal functional and emotional state of the body, uh, which are related to socialization. So perhaps uh, dolphins have a very uh, highly developed uh, social sense as a result. <clears throat> but at any rate, let's start looking at our human brains now and uh, start assigning names to some of these features that we see. So this is a superior view of the brain where we can see this uh, gyrencephalic cortex and we can see it's separated into two hemispheres, a left and a right hemisphere by this longitudinal fissure. Uh, in addition, we can see that on the side of the brain, so here we have a lateral view of the whole brain, we can see a long uh, sulcus, a long groove uh, on the side there separating the upper from the lower portion of the brain and that is called the uh, lateral sulcus. The central sulcus here forms a primary landmark uh, that we, sh we should identify very quickly, very early on in the process of looking at the intact human brain. So the central sulcus, not only uh, is it important because it divides the frontal and parietal cortices, but it's also important because it uh, divides functional elements of the brain. In front of the central sulcus in the precentral gyrus, we get uh, most of our primary motor output, our upper motor neurons, are located in this precentral uh, gyrus. Whereas the postcentral gyrus uh, 
is the target for our sensory pathways. So all of our sensation, our tactile sensation from our body is processed in the postcentral gyrus as a result. Uh, we can also see here uh, separating the parietal cortex from the occipital cortex is the parieto occipital sulcus. Uh, not too hard there. So moving on, let's define all these cortices now and define their, their boundaries and barriers. So the frontal cortex is divided from the parietal cortex via the central sulcus. It's also divided from the temporal cortex below it by the lateral sulcus. We can see here in the mid-sagittal view how that central sulcus extends down uh, into that mid-sagittal uh, view, and we can see the uh, frontal cortex anterior here. Now the parietal cortex is posterior to the central sulcus, uh, so it's um, uh, divided from the occipital cortex via the parieto occipital sulcus. Uh, not too big a deal uh, there either. Now we have the temporal cortex below uh, on the lateral sides of the brain. You can also see it from the mid-sagittal view and the inferior view. So divided from the upper portion of the brain, the upper cortices, by the lateral sulcus. The occipital cortex in the posterior is divided down its uh, middle portion from the mid-sagittal view by the calcarin sulcus. And so we'll learn that that creates a, a cuneus uh, portion and a lingua portion of the occipital cortex. When we talk about the visual pathways, we'll get into those functional aspects to a much greater extent. And finally, <clears throat> if we open up the lateral sulcus and look inside, we will see the insula or the insular cortex, which is responsible for a number of interesting things, including uh, monitoring internal kind of visceral sensations, things like emotions and hunger, uh, those kinds of um, uh, you know, survival-oriented um, uh, passions, um, like those drives, uh, as well as it contains the primary auditory cortex in the posterior portion. Now let's talk about uh, some other landmarks that are important. So here we have a mid-sagittal view. Here we have a superior view with much of the cortices removed, dissected away. So we can see the white matter tracks that cross to the other hemispheres, uh, the other hemisphere. So from one side to the other, the white matter tract that connects the hemispheres is called the corpus callosum. From the mid-sagittal view, when we make a mid-sagittal cut, we'll cut through the corpus callosum and it will be a primary, very dense uh, landmark from the mid-sagittal view. <clears throat> so, um, now let's talk about uh, some of these naming schemes, the terminology we use to describe some of these portions. So the prosencephalon is the developmental term for the forebrain. The prosencephalon ends up creating two regions, uh, two large functional areas of the brain called the telencephalon and the diencephalon. Uh, so the uh, prosencephalon uh, ends up forming both the telencephalon and the diencephalon. The telencephalon is the gyrencephalic portion of the brain, the cortex, the neocortex. The uh, <clears throat> diencephalon forms some of these deeper structures within the prosencephalon, just deep to the telencephalon. So you have the thalamus, which is this big rounded portion, you have the hypothalamus below it, responsible for a lot of the uh, uh, hormones and, and um, endocrine release uh, for the functional elements of the body. And then the epithalamus behind the thalamus. So the epithalamus includes the pineal gland, which regulates our sleep cycles, uh, as well as some, some other uh, interesting functions. <clears throat> Now, uh, heading posteriorly, we have the mesencephalon, the middle portion of the embryonic brain, and that becomes the midbrain. <clears throat> so the midbrain is the portion that connects 
the uh, diencephalon to the rhombencephalon to the pons and the lower portions of the brainstem. So there are some important features in there. We've already learned about some pathways that travel through the uh, the, um, the midbrain uh, pathways like the, um, the uh, corticospinal tract that goes down to form the pyramids in the medulla. Um, so now moving into the rhombencephalon, the hindbrain uh, forms the pons, the cerebellum posteriorly connected to the pons, and then the medulla oblongata below that, which is continuous with the uh, spinal cord. Uh, so anyway, the brainstem is called the brainstem because uh, somebody thought that it looked like cauliflower on top of a stalk. So uh, brainstem is the stalk that uh, you know uh, connects the flowering portion of the brain to the uh, brainstem to the uh, uh, spinal cord, and then just some. Um, some terminology to orient different portions of the brain stem. So uh, we can divide the brain stem into an anterior and a posterior region. The posterior most region is called the tectum or the roof of the brain stem. So that is behind the uh, cerebral aqueduct and the fourth ventricle. So the tectum uh, mainly composed of the colliculi, the superior and inferior colliculi, which you can see represented by these two bumps on the green tectum in this drawing. The uh, tegmentum is uh, the large portion of the uh, brainstem composed mainly. It, so this is the region that has most of the nuclei, the brainstem nuclei. So when we're talking about the uh, cranial nerve nuclei, you will find those within the tegmentum of the brain stem for the most part. Now, the basilar region contains most of the ascending and descending fibers, so the, um, the uh, pyramids are part of the uh, basilar uh, medulla, and those pyramids contain the corticospinal tracts as they descend into the spinal cord, as an example. Now we've talked about the spinal cord at the beginning of the course, so this is just going to be a little bit of a refresher. Uh, so the spinal cord, uh, is, the sections of the spinal cord are, are named after the uh, vertebral region in which the spinal nerve exits. So we'll notice here that each uh, there's individual spinal nerves, and, and those represent the individual sections of the spinal cord. And as we uh, travel uh, caudally, inferiorly along the spinal cord, we can see that those spinal nerves are taking a more and more angled exit out of the spinal cord itself. And that's because the spinal cord only extends down to about L2 vertebra. So most of the lumbar vertebrae do not have a spinal cord uh, within the uh, vertebral canal. The sacrum uh, does not have a spinal cord within it. Instead, those spinal nerves exit out of the spinal cord uh, higher up and then take an angled approach to exit, uh, making these long extended uh, nerve roots. And those nerve roots that bundle together below L2 are called the cauda equina, or the horse's tail. Uh, so we can see that the spinal cord ends here uh, at a portion called the conus medullaris, because it looks like a cone. You know, you go to the uh, doctor's office and you get a drink of water from that water machine, the, the little water machine, and the cup is like a cone. You know, so it's, it's a cone. Well, cones are cones. Uh, but anyway, conus medullaris. It's a cone-shaped uh, terminal termination point of the spinal cord. So we'll also see that the spinal cord has a connective tissue filament or phylum extending off the bottom of it, shown here in this uh, light blue color, shown here in black on the previous slide, in light blue here. That's called the phylum terminale. This, this phylum terminale is very important because it anchors the conus medullaris and the spinal cord into uh, the sacrum uh, to the coccygeal region uh, as well.
So this is an extension of that connective tissue that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord that anchors the spinal cord in place. There's a condition where due to a traumatic force, the phylum terminale can break. When that happens, the spinal cord within the, uh, the vertebral canal will spring up because all of these white matter tracts are, are springy and, and, and uh, taut. So when that happens, the spinal cord springs back up. It pulls tight all of these spinal nerves. And what do the spinal nerves contain within them? They contain afferents and efferents. Afferents including pain fibers. Efferents, the motor fibers. Uh, so a person that has this condition where the phylum terminale has severed is going to experience uh, extreme pain and immobility as a result. So that requires uh, you know, surgical reattachment of the spinal cord. <clears throat> so that's all I have for the moment. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll go more in depth about the individual uh, sulci uh, of the brain itself, sulci and gyri. So thanks for listening.